Good morning. Thanks, uh, Nick. I hope you can all hear me well. And uh, Tom Collet, my colleague from the Welsh Government, is also there on, on the video, so, but I'll be mostly presenting the slides there. Uh, so today, the plan is very much to take you through uh, the implementations of the Open Data Portal uh, currently being implemented uh, with the Welsh Government. Um, so perhaps first I should uh, really uh, introduce myself. Um, I am Pascal Culon, um, Technical Director from uh, CGI, looking after anything uh, GIS mapping across uh, our central government business unit and we deliver anything from enterprise strategy to uh, business solution integrations and really it's all about um, really driving decisions through uh, your applications. So about a year and a half ago the Welsh government contacted uh, CGI to uh, essentially port, upgrade their current uh, data portal, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing it the wrong way, uh, Tom, so correct me there, but essentially uh, was about trying to bring the existing open data portal to, to the next level. And, and really at the time there was a number of key business drivers to consider, was uh, essentially uh, the uh, idea that they needed to very much increase their ability to uh, share their data. I hope you can still see me. I see some warning from Zoom coming up, but I presume it's all okay. Um, right, okay, I'll carry on. Um, so it's about um, then increasing data sharing, moving uh, the platform and data portal very much to uh, a far more uh, flexible, elastic cloud computing. They needed to be able to have a single um, platform to deliver multiple applications, multiple business solutions, but in the same way, they wanted to very much drive those business applications from a single uh, data source, essentially. And all of this, the big drive is to very much lower the maintenance cost. So with any data portal and particularly in the GI world, um, I tend to always think there is a bit of a bumpy road ahead um, in the sense that first it's data obviously, uh, but as soon as we talk about data in the GI world, we all know that it comes from different data source, different data format, and it's usually a little bit of a nightmare. So obviously we need to find a mean to increase interoperability to uh, essentially ultimately share the data effectively across the business solutions. We need to be able to all the way through the implementation delivery of the solution engage with the stakeholders as effectively as possible and at all levels. So you'll see what we've done there with that uh, implementation really helped to engage continuously with agile delivery, uh, two weekly sprint, regular drop, helping to really crystallize uh, the progress of the solutions. With any solutions, whether you know it is open source or proprietary, we can't afford to just have a greenfield project. So we always have to consider legacy system how do we integrate with them? And that, that is a key thing. And you'll see how much I emphasize on that. And that's one of the key principles there with open architecture. Going forward, we can't necessarily, however much I'd love it, or we all love to re-implement everything from scratch and come up with a brand new solutions. We actually have to be quick and we have to consider uh, wherever possible have out of the box solutions and can be actually configurable. And that's the only way really to get business returns, okay? To, to, to really get the maximum out of your investment. So that's one of my favorite slides here, and it's a bit controversial, so bear with me, uh, but I tend to always um, 
few years ago to, to be very much a big advocate of, yeah, let's go all open source. This is the way forward. Well, I'm afraid, I think after uh, 10, 15 years in, in the world there, I would say, yeah, I came, I saw, but I did not conquer, I'm afraid. Bini Vidi, but not Vici. Why? Open source free? No, I disagree, it's not free. You still have to consider fourth line support, okay? Um, large developer base? Yeah, no, I don't agree with that. There's some open source project with only a couple of developers there, and uh, so that doesn't stand. And I can carry on like that, okay? Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, pros arguments that I can actually destroy within a few seconds there. And actually, um, some will say, well, no, I'm not going to use open source guys because there's no support for it. Well, again, I disagree there. Uh, you'll see that the, the platform we've got there in place has got fourth line support um, uh, of an enterprise level, actually. Uh, and you can be confident that most of the OSGO product these days, for instance, can actually be supported. So here's, again, one of these arguments destroyed there. And I can carry on, I can carry on. And actually, on proprietary side of things, I'm afraid, better documentations? Mm, yeah, <laughs> I've seen it, <laughs> okay? Uh, over 20 years working in the GI industry, and I'm not gonna name anybody, there's no point, but I have seen some really poor documentations. We all at fault here. Yeah. So here we go, and here we carry on. So frankly, there's no right or wrong, I'm afraid. I know it's an open source uh, conference today, but I don't think open source is necessarily just the sole answer. That's my key message there. And actually proprietary system aren't the sole answer either. They've all got their pros and cons and we need to find the best of, you know, the best solutions to go forward really. Um, so what do we do? Mm, yeah, okay, well, you will see that for me, it's very much around the concept of open architecture. And the first step is um, most of the time, uh, despite what um, I have been saying a few years ago where I felt that uh, open source was a driver. No, it's not. It should only be an enabler. And why? And we've proven it again on, on the Welsh Gov uh, data portal project in the sense that A, if there is a bug, um, it's great with open source because you can fix it quickly with proprietary solutions. However big your project is or your organizations, you still need a lot of convincing to put your fix, your new features on the roadmap. It helps to increase innovations because ultimately the open source product, you can end up tailoring it to your specific need, but still benefit from the core product. And so ultimately, uh, especially from uh, um, initial investments, you, you really greatly reduce uh, licensing and development cost. Okay, but we need to be mindful that ultimately there is legacy system in your infrastructure. Some will be proprietary system and we need to work with those rather than actually go against them. And that's where the concept of open architecture comes in uh, and really uh, gain its strength. Key things, and that actually, one could really argue uh, the point there, that it can be uh, implemented with uh, proprietary solutions as well. We need to embrace open standards. So in our world, make sure that wherever we can, we use OGC services, the like of WMS, WFS, uh, and, uh, and so on. Those one will help you to really reduce function locking uh, and ultimately uh, version locking because you will be able to swap around. So typical idea here, you've got a geo server, you've got uh, an Esri ArcGIS server, you've got a map server, you've got a QG server, all of them deliver those OTC services and there's no reasons why you could not start having a solutions to swap around depending on the key functionality you're after, because some of those tier there will have additional benefit depending on your project. Um, so it's about as well trying to reduce the decoupling. So it's about trying to make sure that you don't end up with a case where um, 
you put all your eggs in the same basket, you put all your key design, your key functions right into the front end applications, trying to make sure that you use concept of microservices, decouple, decouple. So all of it uh, will uh, help you to have uh, a design open from the start. That's an ongoing re reminder as you go through, through the deployment. So here's a bit of a deployment overview of what we've done um, at uh, the Welsh Gov. So just to explain a little bit. So essentially, we've first made sure that one of the key business uh, driver was in force. We've deployed everything into Microsoft Azure and we've deployed uh, first Geo server uh, through uh, a Kubernetes cluster, helping us to uh, essentially have uh, elastic computing, uh, increasing the numbers of node or reducing them as the load comes onto the applications, or indeed as we've got more and more applications coming into the solutions. The front end, we've decided to use the OSGO product, GeoNode. So that, uh, I'm a big fan of this product, as you will discover. And the basis is that um, it is uh, essentially a product based on the Django Python framework. And it really helps to actually get the best of an out-of-the-box product and implement something quickly. But because they use the model view template pattern, we were able, and you'll see it, to radically um, tune, transform the UI and, and indeed implement additional bespoke functionality. The back end, we didn't want to start managing Postgres ourselves, so we're benefiting from the Azure SaaS environment, and that's obviously a great benefit from maintenance point of view. Now, key innovations comes in terms of data storage. And one of them is still being implemented, but certainly in terms of tile storage, the tile cache, considering the volume of data, we did not want to start storing that uh, on traditional disk. So this is actually stored in blob store. Presenting a potential cost reduction in storage by near to 90%. Same way, the actual raw data, your GOT, uh, the current plan is to store that again into blob stores. So you start saying that not only we are having a really uh, effective platform in terms of uh, resource, um, as the load increase, we increase the size of our cluster, we increase the numbers of node, but in terms of storage, we're also looking at uh, an effective and actually very, very uh, it has, you know, sort of infinite storage with the blob store. So that gives us really the best of both worlds. So without a further ado, I think the best things for me to do is probably to turn my attention to the screen just behind me and start giving you a bit of a tour of uh, the online data portal. So bear with me. So I don't want to do that. And I'll bring that across there and bear with me. I'll come along very shortly. Right, so for those who are familiar with the uh, GeoNode um, uh, product, you can start seeing that first of all, the, the actual home page looks dramatically different. Um, which is, again, as I was saying, one of the key benefits of the um, uh, GeoNode product. We use this commonly called MVC, but with Django, they call it model view template. So we've been able to apply all the uh, corporate styling employed at uh, the Welsh government, essentially GEL2, if I'm right, Tom. I uh, see you nodding. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so that was the first step. Again, um, a great benefit as well with uh, GeoNode is the fact that it's actually out of the box uh, bilingual. So as you can see straight away, I'm able to uh, translate the whole site uh, in, in a flash. So that's obviously a big benefit for the Welsh government. 
from there, I'll be able to then go into um, what anyone would expect into a data portal, my actual data catalog. And again, here, um, still in, in, um, in, in alpha uh, uh, for the time being, uh, you'll see that again, the look and feel of the data catalog compared to what you have with the default geoload is dramatically different. Uh, and, and one must take that as, again, a, a big benefit. So from there, again, we'll be able to uh, dive straight into uh, the actual um, uh, detailed view for, for a given uh, data set. And again, uh, keep on, you know, really, really showing that we've tuned every single aspect of GeoNode. But ultimately, it's just the HTML, HTML page, which we've uh, really tuned, rather than uh, starting to write everything uh, from scratch. Which That's means good. that from the... Just to yep. let you know, five minutes to go. Thank you. Um, so really, uh, that, that gave us the best of both worlds. The ability to, A, uh, have an out-of-the-box product with a solid, Backend, essentially the whole API, the whole view, the whole models already being implemented, but yet have the ability to really tune it to uh, what we really needed. Um, we decided very early on to embrace one of the latest viewer available into the data portal. So essentially uh, what they call the map store viewer based on React technology. And uh, really, that um, fairly well enhanced viewer saved us weeks and weeks, if not months, of developments. Because uh, as you can see, we've got access to quite um, an enhanced type of functionality available. We've got the ability to start um, changing the style. We've got the ability to uh, look at the attribute table. So a whole raft of, you know, default functionality that one would really expect to, to find on uh, any sort of um, GI browsers these days, but available there. Having access to the source code still give us as well a lot of um, flexibility, being able to actually, frankly, fix some bugs. Nobody deliver bug free solutions, they're complex, being able to provide that back to uh, the community and, um, and, and really gave us a lot of flexibility. And going forward, what it means is we've now got a central platform with uh, a really good set of capability and indeed um, a central data source now really for us to, to manage both on desktop, web, or mobile, but yet we'll be able to extend that to uh, an array of business functions. So with that in mind, I'll just bring my last conclusion slide, which I will try to do if I do that, if that works. Brilliant. So what I would say is in terms of uh, benefit realizations, First, uh, because we use agile delivery, we were able to regularly engage with our stakeholders, our product owners. We've been able to really demonstrate um, the various phases of delivery uh, of the data portal influence the design. Um, ultimately, for us, it's very much an hybrid solutions because we've been able to make the most of the GeoNode content management system. Uh, it's a great building blocks, but going forward, we'll be able to extend it to bring additional business applications. Um, um, as I was saying, it's, it's also the fact that um, it's based on Django, uh, we've been able to actually use a lot of the, the, the open source plugin available by Django uh, and, and extend further the, the applications with um, AD sign-on uh, with uh, more comprehensive downloading uh, and, and so on. Again, with the model view template, 
greater use of geo server in the back, we've been really able to greatly decouple the whole solutions. We've embraced really to the maximum we could uh, the use of open standard, saying that, um, again, uh, and that goes back to the hybrid concept, GeoNode accept uh, feeds from RGS server as well. So it gives you best of both worlds, really. And, and ultimately, deploying that in the cloud, notably with a Kubernetes cluster, we are very much able to scale in and out, and, uh, giving us a pay-as-you-go uh, sort of model. Any questions? Wonderful. Thanks very much, Pascal. Yes, we do have a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, and if anybody has any more questions, please do send them in through the chat. Uh, first question is from uh, Krishna Loder, who's, who says, uh, how can I use open layers instead of MapStore in GeoNode? Sure. So MapStore is actually a wrapper around open layers. And as it happens, MapStore um, offers out of the box either leaflet or open layers. So it's just a wrapper around it. And the demo you've seen there actually use open layers. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. That's, that's really interesting. I always find that kind of once you start to unpick some of those, there's so many interconnections between the different uh, programs yeah, and options. It's amazing how interrelated they are. So, so what I would say is GeoNode offers an array of viewers uh, that you can plug in uh, as you wish, really. MapStore is one of them. Um, there is some sort of leaflet one. There is a Maploom as well, which is great for version editing. So, you know, the, the world is, uh, is open, therefore <laughs> you, you can choose whatever you, you wish. But the key mm -hmm. thing is, my advice is don't try to re-implement from scratch uh, a viewer. There's so many available out there. Uh, yeah, tune them to your, to your requirement. Great. Um, another question from Sid. Um, it'd be interesting to ask about how scalable the system has been. So yep. it'd be great to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. So with uh, the Welsh government, and I think I'm waiting for Tom to know there, we've got around about 700 layers loading wow. the system. Um, we've got another project, which I think I can comfortably uh, name, that we've implemented for DEFRA, their Earth Observations Data System, and we've got out there, I think, in the excess of 10,000 layers, and it scales beautifully. We're able to load uh, the data catalog within about three, four seconds each time, because we're using Elasticsearch behind the scene. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really effective. Okay, wow. Um, a, kind, a kind of related follow-up question uh, from Matt de Bond. Is there any documentation or code going into the open for this that we could potentially use to set up similar systems? So anything from the infrastructure to the Azure stuff, set up the concepts, either individual bits or the, the application as a whole? Yes, so um, most of the uh, map store code that we've used uh, and fixed has been pushed back to the open source community. We've tried as much as possible not to deviate from the core product. So we've provided fix to core GeoNode or the various third party libraries. Uh, the rest, the skinning, essentially the, the template element is specific to Welsh government. So there, I can't comment if that will go back to the open source community. I know that the Welsh government is, is a very open minded organizations. Uh, I think, Tom, I don't know if you want to comment any further there, but um, there's certainly a drive to share back anything we're doing. You're on mute, Tom, if you're talking. I, I, I'm guessing possible. Uh, he can't unmute. Um, okay. Fair okay. Uh, Phil, uh, I can do that for you. I should be able to. There we go. Can you unmute now, Tom? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I think it's we're we're happy to feedback whatever we can to the open source community. I think it's more a question of whether it provides value, sort of, to the more general 
Geono, the map store products, or whether it, they are kind of customizations that that are really sort of niche to to our sort of business requirements. But yeah, where, wherever anything gets fixed that is useful to the core products, we'd be really keen to get that back in there. As as, as much from a kind of selfish point of view, that it means that that there's less deviation between our implementation and and the core products because every time GeoNode gets updated, there's a there's a burden sort of um, mer merging those changes in with the customization. So the less customization and deviation, the better from our point of view. One thing that we've worked really hard uh, on this project, and we're still uh, in the midst of finalizing finalizing this, is the whole. Um, continuous integration, continuous deployment, which is really key in this type of project. So uh, that's that's very important. But uh, I think it's Matt from JNCC who was asking the questions there. So if he wants to, if he's got a specific requirement, Matt, do, do get in touch. I'll be happy to, to explain you any more. Um, uh, one, one more question from uh, Marty Peresi. Apologies if I've pronounced that completely incorrectly. Um, are you using Geonode 2 or Geonode 3? Particularly um, if you're using Geonode 2, are you worried that it uses Python 2, not Python 3? There we go. So here's, <laughs> here's a very pertinent question. By the end of this week, we'll have migrated, hopefully, if our spring goes to plan, to Python 3. So yes, we wanted to move away from uh, the fact that Python, uh, so Geonode 2 is on Python 2.7, uh, where uh, essentially Python 2.7 is obviously not supported anymore. So yes, we are migrating across. Mm -hmm. And was that very painful or uh, was it a bit manageable? Uh, well, we're still in the midst of it. <laughs> so, but what I would say is, is as per expected. Uh, so uh, it's not too, too painful. Uh, obviously Geono 3 is out there. Um, so there is, there is a logical path to upgrade and uh, yeah, it's, it's no more scary than upgrading, upgrading from a .NET framework versions to another one really. Mm. Uh, there, there is a good uh, upgrade path there. Wonderful. Um, that's great. Thank you very much. What uh, we'll do now is I should be able to... Okay. Never mind. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, Pascal, and uh, yeah. thank you for your input, Tom, and thank you everyone for your questions as well. They're really great questions and it's great to have a bit of discussion about that, that side of things. Um,